Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is John Efron. I'm the director of the Center for Jewish Studies. And um, it's, a, it's a, not just a thrill, but it's an honor to um, have Mark Oppenheimer with us today. Uh, today's program uh, is part of Berkeley's Antisemitism Education Initiative, a collaboration between the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies at the Graduate Theological Union, the Berkeley Center for Jewish Studies, and the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies, and the Talby Center for Jewish Studies. So it takes a village. So it's all there's the cooperation and support of all of those units. America's institutions were sorely tested over the last five years. And during that stress test, one of the core principles of the civic belief system has been challenged probably as never before. I'm referring to the idea of American exceptionalism. An immutable law of American civil, civic religion, it was put to the test with the breach of one norm after another by Trump, first as a presidential candidate and then as president with the full-throated backing of the Republican Party. And there are historical examples, predecessors for this. One axiomatic element of the entire edifice of American exceptionalism is the belief shared by generations of American Jews that there has never been in history a country so welcoming of and hospitable towards Jews. While a very strong argument can be made in defense of these claims, and I'm actually not going to challenge them here, but for them to hold up under historical scrutiny, and I am a historian for those who don't know, the claim needs to be made with the full recognition that there has been in the United States a very long history of anti-Semitic discriminatory practices such as the long battle over the course of the 19th century to achieve civic equality at the state level, higher education quotas against Jews, housing covenants against Jews, some still in effect into the mid 1960s, the Aliens Act of 1924, which basically shut America's doors to Jews and others seeking to leave Europe, the long history of hate groups in the US, most of which were and remain deeply and foundationally anti-Semitic, and the explosion of violent anti-Semitism over the last few years, with, for example, the Jews being the only group mentioned by name at Charlottesville, the recent violent street attacks on Jews in New York City by right-wing neo-fascists, while in the name of progressive politics, social justice, and a burning hatred of Israel, we saw violent attacks on Jewish diners at a restaurant in Los Angeles. We see loyalty questions put to Jewish students when they wish to join various campus organizations the vehement anti-Israel discourse that relies upon tropes drawn from the deep and ancient well of anti-Semitic discourse, the ever-expanding cesspit that is online anti-Semitic content churned out by the far right and the far left. And finally, the fact that the FBI's 1920, 2020, 20, would that it were 1920, 2020 hate crime statistics showed that crimes targeting Jews comprised 57.5% of all religious bias crimes. All of these things and many, many other features of American anti-Semitism need to be accounted for when we speak of American Jewish exceptionalism. Perhaps no single recent event has posed a greater challenge to the notion of American Jewish exceptionalism than the mass murder at the Tree of Life Synagogue on October 27th, 2018. Of the many reactions to the shooting, one that was most striking was the repeated refrain by many in the American Jewish community, especially younger Jews, that basically they could not believe that something like this could happen in the United States. To be fair, there was utter incredulity across the entire Jewish community, irrespective of age. And yet, had Jews been more attuned to American anti-Semitism, past and present, that have seen an abundance of evidence much of it fresh and new, that made the chances of such a heinous act being perpetrated more than possible. The killer Robert Bowers made his views about Jews clear online, and they comported with the world Jewish conspiracy theories sprouted by the far right and the very far left of the political spectrum. He is far from the only American whose worldview is thoroughly shaped by hatred of Jews. The shooting and its aftermath are important moments in American history and events of singular importance in American Jewish history. And it's a story that absolutely needs to be told. And in Mark Oppenheimer, 
the telling of that story could not be in better hands. Mark is the coordinator of the Yale Journalism uh, Initiative and has been a lecturer in Yale's English department, political science department and divinity school. He received his BA in history and his PhD in religious studies from Yale. He was a religion columnist for the New York Times from 2010 to 2016, having written the beliefs section and has written for the New York Times Magazine, GQ, Washington Post, Slate, Mother Jones, The Nation and The Believer, among other things. He's been a commentator on NPR and is also a host of Tablet Magazine's podcast, Unorthodox. And he's the author of five books, including the newest Jewish encyclopedia. His most re recent book, at which he's here to talk about, is entitled Squirrel Hill, The Tree of Life Synagogue Shooting and the Soul of a Neighborhood. According to the historian, uh, Michael Alexander, it is, and I'm quoting, the best portrait of a Jewish community in America since Irving Howe's World of Our Fathers. High praise indeed. One of the things that make it, such, make it the best such portrait, and there've been a couple of others, uh, is that Mark's father is actually from the Squirrel Hill Jewish community. So Mark is close to it. He knows it, he understands it, feels it. In addition to recounting the shooting itself, he offers a very deeply informed deeply felt and deeply intimate portrait of the community in the wake of the tragedy and how it coped with a mass shooting that was of such magnitude that it sorely tested specifically no Jewish notions of American exceptional, American Jewish exceptionalism. It's a privilege for us to be able to welcome Mark Oppenheim to Berkeley, even if only virtually. And unfortunately he's so close, he's in Berlin game, yeah. but Sadly, we're not all in the same room. So Mark, it's yours, all yours. Thank, John, John, thank you so much. And I also wanna um, thank a lot of students from Tulane who I understand have joined us and so many people uh, in, in Zoom land. Yes, I was in the Berkeley Hills today, um, knocking on the door of my friend Susan Hyde, who's a professor of political science at Berkeley and a dear old friend from her days in Connecticut. And I know that she helped make this happen as well. So I'm super grateful. Okay, so let's roll up our sleeves and I'm gonna talk for 20, 25 minutes. And then I wanna take your questions, uh, which is always the most fun part for me. It's the most fun part when I'm teaching my own undergraduate and occasionally graduate classes. And um, uh, it's, it, it's the most fun part on Zoom as well. So let me tell you a story. Um, it was October 27th, 2018. I'm gonna tell you this, let me back up. I'm gonna tell you a story. We're gonna look at some photographs from the book and then uh, we're gonna take some questions. It was October 27th, 2018. I had taken my eldest daughter, Rebecca, who is now a high school sophomore, but was then a 12 year old, I guess, a seventh, eighth grader, seventh grader, um, to Newton, Massachusetts, about two hours from our home to attend the bat mitzvah of a, of a summer camp friend of hers. So it being the Sabbath, um, we left our phones in the car, we went inside the synagogue and, you know, attended the service, heard her friend chant Torah. Uh, had a nice big lunch and didn't really leave again until about one o'clock. I mean, it was a long lunch and she was reuniting with all these summer camp friends. So um, we hung inside and schmoozed until about one o'clock and I got back out to the car and I opened up my, my phone, turned it on to call my wife, just check in. And I saw all these text messages and, and they all had something to do with Pittsburgh. Are you going to Pittsburgh? Did you hear about Pittsburgh? Do you know anyone in Pittsburgh? Um, what's up with Pittsburgh? And I had no idea what was going on. So I um, navigated over to one of my news apps, probably the New York Times app, and I saw the big headline, you know, um, unknown number dead in synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. And I began reading and I, Rebecca looked at me and she saw the concern on my face, said, Dad, what's wrong? And I said, there was a, a synagogue shooting and people were killed in Squirrel Hill. And she said, Dad, aren't, aren't we from Squirrel Hill? Isn't that where we're from? And I said, yeah. That is. Now, not literally. I'm from Massachusetts originally, and my children are all Connecticut born. But my dad, uh, her grand Rebecca's grandpa, uh, who's still with us and in good health, uh, is, is from Squirrel Hill, the old Jewish neighborhood in Pittsburgh, as was his father, as was his father. And the father and father before that were also in Pittsburgh, but, but not yet in Squirrel Hill, because Squirrel Hill became a neighborhood and very quickly a Jewish neighborhood around the time of World War I, so 1917, 18, 1920 or so. So for about a hundred years, Squirrel Hill has been a substantively Jewish neighborhood. It's been about a third Jewish for about a century, which um, by my count makes it the oldest, most stable, consistently Jewish neighborhood in America. There are 
older Jewish neighborhoods that have declined. There are more recent Jewish neighborhoods, especially ones that came up after World War II. But if you say, where have you found Jewish life for a century in America, you'd want to say Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. So the idea that the worst anti-Semitic slaughter in American history, the worst anti-Semitic slaughter on this land from before we were a country, because of course Jews have been here since the 17th century, until now, happened in this, this little Jewish Eden, this place that had been a haven for Jews, where they happily lived largely free of prejudice for about a century. There's a really thick irony in that. This would have, you would have thought this would have been the place where it was least likely to happen. And instead, 11 people were killed that day. So as John mentioned, I host a podcast. It's called Unorthodox. Um, and it's kind of my side project, but it's been enormous fun. For six years, we've been um, doing a weekly podcast about Jewish life and culture. It's usually very funny. It's usually me and my two co-hosts, all of us Jews, um, having a good laugh at the expense of our fellow Jews, talking about stories uh, from Hollywood, from Israel, from New York, from New Orleans, wherever there are Jews, there are funny stories about stuff that's going on in the news. Um, and But once in a while, we get serious. And uh, we immediately dispatched a couple people to Pittsburgh, where they got audio tape. And within 48 hours, we had produced a special podcast episode, which you can still find online, about what was going on in the neighborhood, voices of grief from the neighborhood. But somehow, that didn't feel like enough for me. Again, I'm someone who's a fifth generation, I would have been a sixth generation Pittsburgher if I'd grown up there. And I still have relatives in Squirrel Hill. And I was very, very interested in this neighborhood. Um, you know, as a religion journalist, I've covered a lot of happy stuff, but I've also covered a lot of trauma. I've done a lot of reporting on sexual abuse in religious communities, uh, not just in the Roman Catholic community, which is stereotypically where we think the religious abuse is, but also in the American Buddhist community, which um, had uh, way too much uh, and way more than you would think in, in terms of sexual abuse over the past 50 years. Um, in American Judaism, in the American atheist community, which has a, a terrible misogyny problem. So, and I've covered all sorts of, of, of difficult topics uh, on my beat as a religion re reporter and scholar for 25 years. Um, so I, I was both drawn to this story, but also repelled by it. I knew that I did not want to write anything about the shooter which is usually what people are interested in after a mass killing. Now, those of you who are younger than I am, let's say you were born in 1999. Let's say you're a senior now and you were born in 1999. You literally have lived your life contemporaneously with the age of mass shootings uh, in America. If, if we define that as beginning with the Columbine shooting, which is really when they started coming more and more frequently. And in those years since 1999, there, the FBI counts anything as a mass killing if four or more people are killed in one instance. And there have been several hundred mass killings since 1999. This is the era of the mass killing, where there's a kind of epidemic of, of violent killings, of random killings in America. Um, and often the big question is, who's the shooter and why did he, almost exclusively he, uh, do it? I was not interested in the killer here. Um, I'm not personally interested in criminals, and I certainly was not interested in this alleged shooter who we very quickly knew had a history, as John said, of putting anti-Semitic hatred online. Um, he was clearly, again, allegedly, but you know he's going to trial soon probably, uh, clearly from the, had lived in the white supremacist anti-Semitic bowels of of the internet. And I had no interest in learning more about him by going on Gab and wherever else, whatever websites he was on. What did interest me was the neighborhood, was Squirrel Hill. I was interested in the neighborhood as a protagonist of, um, of the aftermath. I was very interested in what, in how people in this community that was so famously tight knit and so famously safe for Jews, I was very interested in how they would cope and whether the fact that this was a tight knit caring Jewish community, and also the fact that the 11 people who were killed were, were worshipers. Uh, they belonged to three different congregations housed in one building, the Tree of Life building. Um, and they knew each other, and their families knew each other, and most of them were from the neighborhood, were, were from walkable distances in the neighborhood. So I was very interested in how being part of a walkable, tight-knit, urban community might help people thrive and might help people cultivate resilience in the aftermath of this shooting. So I began going. I just thought I'll go to the neighborhood and I'll talk to everyone I can. And starting within a few weeks after the shooting, three years ago, I went to Pittsburgh 32 times over the next 18 months. And my last trip was just as COVID was kind of making travel 
difficult um, in March of 2020. So I went 32 times uh, between November of 18 and March of 2020, interviewed about 250 people, including nine of the 11 people who survived the attack. There were 22 people inside the building, 11 were killed, 11 survived. I talked to nine of the survivors of the, of the 11 victims. I uh, talked to family members of eight of the victims. So I got a really panoramic sense of the aftermath of the survivors, of how they coped, of how they dealt, and what the neighborhood meant to them. So I now want to take you through some photographs from the book. It was very important to me that the book be illustrated with photographs, because as much as I think I'm a good writer and I think that I know how to conjure a scene, I also felt like um, nothing would bring you to the neighborhood as well as seeing photographs from the neighborhood. So the book has 60 photographs. Every few pages, you'll find another photograph. And that, that was very important to me. And I'm going to take you through it. And, and again, I want you to, to think, to realize that all of these are from after the killing. There's no photographs of the killer. There aren't even any photographs of the victims. Uh, because as, as important as these 11 souls are, my question was really, what comes after? When the crime leaves, what does it leave in its wake? So I want to I want to share some of these um, with you right now. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about them, and then I want to take your um, questions. So let's see here. This is the cover of the book, um, and um, those are uh, kind of memorial candles. That's in front of the Tree of Life Synagogue. People have lit little uh, yard side candles, the candles that you traditionally light on the first anniversary of a Jew's death. You can also see the flowers. The flowers are interesting because the flowers, while beautiful and everyone was happy to have them, are typically a kind of Christian symbolism. Jews don't tend to do flowers in the aftermath of death. But of course, most of the mourners, most of the people who came to offer the support were, were Christian allies, not necessarily Jews um, themselves. Um, let's see here. This fellow here is a man named Gregory Zanus. And he is actually, he died last December um, of cancer. Um, but he was very famous. His obituary was in the New York Times. He founded a, non a nonprofit called Crosses for Losses. And what he did was after every mass killing, starting with Columbine and actually going back a little before that to some uh, gun crimes in Chicago, he would build crosses. He would build them himself. He was a retired carpenter, an evangelical Christian. And he would build these crosses and paint them himself and put them in his truck and drive them to anywhere in the country that there had been victims of, uh, of a violent crime or of a violent death. Sometimes it was plane crashes, but it was usually victims of gun violence. And he would paint the names, he would hand paint the names of the victims on, um, on, on the crosses and then put them in the ground. He put several million miles on several different pickup trucks. He, he, he wore three or four different pickup trucks into the ground over 20 years driving around the country. This is what he did with his retirement. And when he came to Squirrel Hill, there was a very moving scene that I heard recounted to me by a woman named Tammy Hepps, where she encountered him in front of the synagogue. He had just arrived from Aurora, Illinois. He'd been driving all night. And he was. A, she saw these crosses and she was She was absolutely mortified. And she said, to, she said the way she put it to me, please forgive the language, please uh, excuse the, uh, the, the swearing, but I wanna be honest to what she said. She, she told me, I thought to myself, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Um, does he really think he's gonna put crosses in front of a synagogue, this Christian symbolism in front of the synagogue? But then she looked in the back of his truck and she saw that he had 11 stars of David, 11 Jewish stars. And what she realized what he was gonna do was affix the Jewish stars to the fronts of the crosses to obscure the Christian symbol and make it Jewish. And you'll see in a minute how he, how he did that. But he arrived within, within 24 hours of the killing. He, he was there to do memorial art. And so I like beginning with this because first of all, he was on the ground. You can actually see, a, see people in the background who were also gathered in front of the synagogue. He was a Christian ally and the, the memorialization, the artwork started almost immediately. Um, speaking of the artwork, and I spent a lot of the book talking about art. Some of you, the football fans will recognize that um, this is a, a riff a mashup of the Pittsburgh Steelers logo, um, except that the yellow hypocycloid at the top of the Steelers logo has been replaced with a Jewish star of David. This was the work of a Lutheran American, German American graphic designer, not a Jew, a German American named Tim Hindis who lived in the Pittsburgh suburbs. And a couple hours after the shooting, he was sitting um, anxiously at his laptop, figuring, asking himself, what can I do to help? And he thought, well, I'm a graphic designer, I'll start designing something. And he said, what represents Pittsburgh? He thought the Pittsburgh Steelers football team. So he, he pulled up the Pittsburgh Steelers logo. How can I make it Jewish? He, he fiddled around a little bit, 
put up the Star of David? Um, how can I, how can I, what sort of language do I want to use? Well, after the Boston Marathon bombing, people had said Boston strong, I'll say stronger than hate. And he put this on Facebook. It was shared a bajillion times. And within a day, people were holding up this signage at, um, at the Pittsburgh Steelers game the next day. The signage was in, in the storefront in Squirrel Hill. It became the iconic symbol. And again, it came from a Christian ally. Um, let's see. Uh, speaking of symbolism, this was the front page of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette the Friday after the shooting. Those of you who read Hebrew will be able to read it right to left. It says, Yitgadal v'yitgadah shamei rabah, with, with a little typo at the very end of it. There's a hay where there should be an aleph, but it's a very, uh, a, an almost precise rendering of the first sentence of the mourner's Kaddish, the prayer for the dead in Judaism. Uh, this was, as far as anyone knows, the first time that Hebrew orthography had been used in an American uh, English language newspaper headline. And um, it was the brainchild of David Shribman, the former editor of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, who, uh, whose daughter actually is, a, is now a reform rabbi, she was just ordained. Uh, and um, he wanted to do something that had special meaning to the Jewish community. So he, um, he decided let's print the first line of the mourner's prayer. And you know people tell stories of having um, picked up their newspaper that Friday and just breaking down in tears. It was so, it was so meaningful to them. This is the, uh, of course, what's more American than Starbucks. This is the Starbucks at the corner of Forbes and Shady in the heart of Squirrel Hill. It's probably one of the busiest Starbucks you'll ever see. There are two Starbucks in Squirrel Hill within a half mile of each other, but this is the busier one, I think. And the manager of Starbucks, um, Melissa Lysot, who is a Christian, uh, Presbyterian American from the Pittsburgh suburbs, she wanted to do something to honor her Jewish customers after the shooting. Uh, she's not an artist, but she called a friend of hers. Uh, the friend is, in fact, a Roman Catholic. And she said, let's do something Jewish for the windows. And the artist, the Catholic artist, consulted with a Jewish uh, uh, acquaintance. And they decided to put in three Jewish symbols inside hearts, a Star of David, a Tree of Life, and a dove. Um, those of you who went to synagogue on Saturday know that we actually read the story of Noah's Ark this week. And, you know, we know everything is is kosher, is copacetic when the dove, when, when he sees the dove. And so this is the week of the dove in the Torah. But um, you'll also see the Hebrew lettering, the words love, ahava, kindness, chesed, and tikva, hope. Um, that became the window display that everyone walked by and thought about. And it's still there and it will probably be there forever. And I imagine I imagine the, the teenagers 20 years from now gathering there after high school to drink their you know frappuccinos at that Starbucks and wondering why is there Hebrew lettering in the Starbucks? And people will tell them the story of how the Catholic and the Presbyterian decided to honor the Jews with the Starbucks art the week after the shooting. Um, this one's very dear to my heart. Uh, I took this picture, which is why it's badly composed as a photograph, but it's on my iPhone. If you notice the H on the Squirrel Hill sign, it has a little uh, homemade cutout tinsel paper Star of David. Uh, hanging from it. Those were everywhere in Squirrel Hill in the um, weeks after the shooting. A Facebook group collected thousands of them from around the world and then organized their distribution. People hung them from trees, from lampposts. I remember being in Squirrel Hill one night in January, February, and it was lightly snowing. And you looked up and you saw the snow, the snowflakes falling down and they fell amidst all of these stars of David hanging from the trees. And it was simply beautiful. Most of those stars, of course, were damaged by the winter. This was, this. I took this photograph in the spring at some point. It was one of the last stars in Squirrel Hill from that whole public art project that still, that was still there. Uh, the funerals took place over four days and this is a bunch of Orthodox men following one of the hearses to the cemetery. I think this is important because none of the people killed were themselves Orthodox. They were reform or conservative or reconstructionist Jews. They were from more liberal streams of Judaism. And yet the whole community came together in the aftermath. That was what was so important was, you know, Squirrel Hill is the kind of place, and this is very rare in American Judaism, where the Orthodox and the non-Orthodox work together. They live near each other, they know each other, and they work together. And the, the role of the Orthodox in the aftermath helping to prepare some of the bodies for their burial, for example, guarding the bodies because it's Jewish tradition that bodies never be left alone, that corpses be, be accompanied between death and the time they're put in the ground, that you never leave the corpse alone. And, and the Orthodox men and women took a, a huge role in doing that. So the, 
you can almost call it interfaith cooperation, even though the Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews are the same faith, they are often they often behave differently in America and they don't act as if they're one faith. And in Pittsburgh, in Squirrel Hill, they really did. Um, this, if you look in the lower right, this is just a man. Um, we don't really know who he is. Um, I mean, his we know his name, but he, he doesn't seem to have any role in, in he, he wasn't a relative of one of the dead. He was just someone who came out to honor them, to pay his respects. He's standing at the gates of the cemetery, watching the cars go in and just crying. I just always found that a very moving photograph. So I put it in the book. Um, one of the other things that happens in the aftermath of a shooting is a lot of money flows into town. People who can't come often want to give in other ways. And so they go online, they donate to memorial funds, they donate to funds for the victims. The single biggest fundraiser in the aftermath of the Tree of Life shooting was a Muslim Iranian expatriate uh, named Shai Khatiri. Uh, he fled Iran for America. He hopes to become an American citizen. Here he is holding up the great classic of Western civilization, Plato's Republic, standing in front of the White House. He is a, a gung-ho future American, and he um, has tremendous affection for the diversity of America, including the Jews whom he's gotten to know, and many of whom have been benefactors of his and mentors of his. He's now a grad student at Johns Hopkins. And he woke up the morning after the shooting. Uh, he was crashing at a friend's place. His friend who was hosting him was Jewish. She was beside herself with grief. He said, what's wrong? She told him that Jews had been killed in Pittsburgh. He went to a coffee shop in Washington, D.C. He went on GoFundMe.org. He set up a fundraising page that ended up raising more than a million dollars, which was out of the seven million that ended up being raised for the victims and their families. Um, Shai Khatiri is responsible for over a million of it. Again, a, a lapsed Muslim Iranian future American, you know, raising a million dollars for uh, the Jewish community. A bunch of teenagers gathered at that Starbucks that we already saw and planned a Havdalah service. Havdalah is the Saturday night ceremony, the ritual that marks the end of the Sabbath. And um, the organized Jewish community, the Jewish Federation, the Jewish synagogues was planning to do something the next day, Sunday night. So, you know, 36 hours after the shooting, but a bunch of teenagers from Alderdice High School felt they should do something sooner. They wanted to do something right away. So they got the candles together. Someone's being very loud. Make sure everyone's muted if you could. Thanks. Um, they got all the candles together. They got the stage together. They got a guitarist to come play songs and they organized an event that ended up drawing, uh, as you can see, several thousand people to the intersection of Forbes and Murray in the Squirrel Hill Commercial District. And this is dusk, the day of the shooting. You see that people have their umbrellas out. Um, it was drizzling all day off and on. You see that people are holding up either candles or what counts as a candle in the year 2021, which is an iPhone uh, flashlight app. Um, after a shooting, people want to come. Presidents, politicians, people want to come, uh, put in an appearance. Donald Trump said almost immediately that he was coming. There was a lot of controversy about this uh, because many people blamed the president or blamed supporters of the president or blamed the president's white nationalist rhetoric or seeming sympathy for white nationalist rhetoric for the shooting. And they felt that for him to come was a real soccer punch. There were protests, there were um, demands that nobody meet with him. And yet the rabbi of Tree of Life, Jeffrey Myers, whom you see on the right here, did meet with the president and with uh, Mrs. Trump. And um, they talked to him about 20 minutes and then he sort of gave them a tour of the outside of the synagogue. You can see in front of these three people, Greg Zanus is, crosses for losses. This, you can see the, the white crosses with the stars of David. Remember, we saw him in the first photograph, and he's written the names of all of the people on the stars. He took out a can of black paint right in front of the synagogue and wrote Sylvan Simon, Bernice Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, Rose Malinger, and so forth. All 11 stars had a name on them and then were planted uh, in the ground in front of the synagogue. And this is where Trump is on that day. Uh, this is the Tuesday after the shooting, three days after the shooting. Now, there was a huge counter-protest when Trump came. What you see here is a beautiful photograph of some of the protesters. You'll notice they're holding up strips of black paper. What they're doing is performing a version of the Korea uh, ritual, which in Jewish mourning is, um, is usually, historically is performed by tearing a piece of your garment when you hear that someone you know has died as an act against your own vanity to say that, you know, my own appearance doesn't matter. What am I in light of this death? People would often rip a piece of their clothing. It then evolved into pinning a piece of black fabric to your clothing and tearing the black fabric. What they did at this Trump protest was they held up, they distributed strips of black paper and they went silent and all at once on command, they ripped 
the pieces of black paper as an act of mourning and also a protest against Trump's visit. So you can see them holding up torn pieces of black paper to the sky. Not every bit of anti-Trump rhetoric was um, as uh, poetic as that one. Uh, I, this is a photograph that didn't make it into the book, but um, there were some people who had <laughs> other ways of expressing their displeasure with the president. Um, there were not a lot of these signs. By and large, it was a, uh, the, the tone was a lot more somber than this. There was, however, one arrest. That's University of Pittsburgh sociology professor Joshua Bloom. And uh, he lay down in front of the motorcade and began meditating and went, went si into silent meditation um, in front of Trump's motorcade and ended up being arrested by Pittsburgh police officers who he said were very polite to him and he was released the next day and no, no, no charges were, were pressed. Not only politicians want to come in the aftermath of something like this, uh, celebrities come. Uh, they mean well, they want to help. Um, some people think that it's opportunistic. Some people think that, um, you know, that it's kind of showmanship, but uh, Tom Hanks has also lent his name to one of the fundraising efforts. He's some sort of honorary chairperson of a committee to um, renovate Tree of Life, which has suffered enormous bullet damage and also has blood stains on its floor and needs a pretty thorough renovation. Here he is hugging Joanne Rogers, who in a sense is America's first lady. She is the, was, until she died herself, she was the widow of Mr. Rogers, of Fred Rogers, of TV's Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's worth saying, by the way, as Pittsburghers all know, that uh, Fred Rogers lived in Scroll Hill for uh, 50 years. He worshipped at Sixth Presbyterian Church at the corner of Forbes and Murray, right across from the Jewish Community Center. And um, so in a very real sense, when he created Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood at Pittsburgh Public Television, uh, he was basing it on Squirrel Hill. Squirrel Hill is, in a sense, in a very real sense, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It, it gave us the template that we all hold for the classic kind of homey, loving American neighborhood. It was based on Squirrel Hill by Fred Rogers. Uh, again, in the vein of celebrities coming, and back to football fandom, some of you will recognize the, the luscious white locks of famed National Football League franchise owner Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots. I snapped this photograph in synagogue on the Sabbath, even though I try not to take photographs on the Sabbath, to respect the Sabbath, because it, he, this is the Patriots owner wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers stronger than hate yarmulke. And I thought it may be the only extant photograph of the Patriots owner wearing the athletic garb of a team other than the New England Patriots. But here he is talking to Rabbi Myers and he had shown up, he, had, he was a surprise guest at the bar mitzvah of a, a young boy at Tree of Life Synagogue in their temporary space at a different synagogue in the December after the shooting. And he put on a Pittsburgh stronger than a hate yarmulke for that day. Dogs were everywhere in the aftermath. Um, in the, these are therapy dogs, trauma dogs, canine advocates as some of them are called. As many of you know, um, the use of pets to help people heal and process trauma has become fairly widespread. And I actually spent a good deal of time in the book talking about, uh, about the therapy dogs, though not as much time as I wanted to because I really love the dogs <laughs> and I'm a dog person. Um, you can see this little girl is holding a card that says, thank you for keeping the Jews in my neighborhood safe. Thank you for risking your lives to save my Jewish community. Lily, age six, love Mikey, age nine. And I, part of me wanted this photograph to be the cover of the book, the therapy dog, the child, the card thanking the police. I should say several police were, were shot and injured in responding to the shooting as well. Um, and there's tremendous affection in the Pittsburgh community for the police who risked their lives um, after to, to stop the shooter. Um, I wanted this dog and this child on the cover of my book, but I realized that the dog that the, the book would get misplaced. It would be end, end up in the uh, the animal section. If you call it Squirrel Hill and put a dog on the cover, between squirrels and dogs, no one will ever find it in the right section. So we had to do something different. But I love this photograph. This is Joe Charney, who was the eldest the oldest survivor of the shooting. Uh, he was ninety one, and um, he saw the shooter. He, they may have locked eyes, and then the shooter didn't shoot at him; shot at someone else. And when I asked Joe Charney if he felt that he um, had been traumatized, he said, no, not at all. He, he said, I don't attend any of the support groups or the grief groups. He said, you know, when, you've, when you're when you a veteran of war as I am, he survived World War II. He said, I've, I've seen so much stuff um, that frankly being in a mass killing and getting out alive was not the worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, he also told me before I left that uh, he had had a son 
who died of AIDS in the 1980s. He was one of the early AIDS victims, his son David, who was a gay man, uh, a tenured professor at Harvard Law School, a very brilliant man. You can find his obituary in the New York Times. And, um, and he died of HIV-related infections. And this is, this is his dad. Um, and, you know, it was very much, a, it made me realize that, you know, as bad as, as being in a mass shooting event is, that for, for Joe, he was very clear that having seen death in World War II and also having lost his son to AIDS, um, he'd been through so much that actually he felt pretty resilient when this came along. It also might help that by the time you're in your 90s, you've, you've sort of, you lived a good life. And um, it was just an interesting counterpoint because some people were very, um, felt that the, the the grief counseling, the trauma support, all of these these supports that come in after a mass shooting were very, very helpful. This was a man who said, I didn't really need any of that. Just a reminder of the diversity of experiences after grief. And I, I kind of want to conclude with this guy because it's a really fun story. This is Robert Zacharias. He's holding a, a challah that he baked himself, as he told me when he sent me this picture. And he was someone I met in the very early days of my reporting and he was wearing a yarmulke and I had thought maybe he was a, an Orthodox Jew. He was not, in fact, he's a fairly secular Jew, but he told me the story of how in the hours after the shooting, when he was um, ready to, um, when he was getting ready to go to the, the teenagers Havdalah event that we saw the pictures of, the thousands of people with the candles, he reached into his closet and got a yarmulke and he put it on. And then when the shooting was over, when, when the memorial event was over, he kept it on. And then the next day he thought, well, what the heck, I'll put it on again. And he kept putting it on. And he started wearing his yarmulke and he started presenting visibly as a Jew. And um, that to me was such an interesting and poetic story that, you know, this was someone who was not, he didn't know anyone at Tree of Life. He's not a synagogue goer himself. He wasn't related to anyone there. He was just a Jewish guy who lived in Pittsburgh who, whose response to the tragedy was to just be more visibly Jewish. And, um, and I heard a lot of stories like that. I, I talked to a woman named Lynn, Lynn Hyde who decided the day after the shooting, uh, or the day of the shooting, really, that she was going to convert to Judaism. She was married to a Jewish guy and, and, and was interested in Judaism, but had never thought that she would convert. And then she realized, you know, I think the, I think this is my tribe. I think that, that these are my people and I want to be fully with them. And there were so many stories like that. So I guess I just want to conclude, you know, I want to stop there and say that um, the book is about all these micro stories, is about the, the challah bakers and the people who put on a yarmulke for the first time and the therapy dogs and the celebrity visits. It's about all these things that happen in the community. And it also is about how they happen even more so when the affected people all lived in a neighborhood together. You know, so many American mass shootings occur to a random grouping of people. If, if, you're, if you're killed, at a shopping mall, the 10 people who were killed with you, all you have in common with them is that you all went to that mall that day and you might be radically different people from, and you, you all live within 30 miles on the freeway of that mall, of that mall exit. And that's what most American shootings are like. They occur to atomized groups of people who don't know each other and their families don't know each other. And they all kind of end up grieving alone and what was so interesting about Squirrel Hill was this was a test case of what happens when people who are affected live near each other and when the, the survivors and the relatives and all the people who feel the pain bump into each other at the supermarket, at the bookstore, at the public library, at the post office, at all of the little neighborhood institutions that, that bring them together and help them step out of their grief. And I think that's something pretty special that happened in Squirrel Hill. And I think there's a lot about neighborhood and community that we can all learn from it. So thank you. And let me stop there. And I'm super excited to hear uh, if I have John... a question. I'm yeah, great. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to know uh, why you, um, you haven't mentioned the Poway shooting, which took place at about the same time. Yeah. And yet uh, that shul was up and running within a matter of weeks, OK? Yeah. And the Tree of Life took quite a bit longer. I I'm quite familiar with it because my granddaughters go to a Hebrew school there. Okay. Uh -huh. And were there during the shooting. And also in Israel, when there's a mass killing, the place is usually open within a day or two. And everyone goes on with life and, you know, they just get on with their lives. Um, and yet you, you, you um, that's, as, that's as much as a, um, a description of a community coming together as what they did in uh, in Pittsburgh. 
Yep. So let me let me take that question. I think I I, I deal with this a lot in the book actually. Um, the gentleman is right. So the Poway shooting happened about six months afterwards to the day. It happened during Pesach, uh, the following spring. And that was a shooting in San Diego County at a Chabad synagogue uh, where the rabbi lost a finger in the shooting and a woman who was uh, attending got killed. And uh, it was very traumatic for the people in Pittsburgh to think it was happening again within six months at a different synagogue. And it is true that in most places in um, Jewish life, I would also say in Christian life, the Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina where nine African-American Christian worshipers were killed in 2015, 2015, 16, I forget which, uh, they were up and running very quickly as well. The question of why the Tree of Life building did not come back into use fairly quickly is a really, really interesting one. Um, it, it's, it remained a crime scene for a long time, so that's part of it, is that uh, the FBI was involved, federal prosecutors, federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, so there was yellow tape around it for a good period of time. But even after that, um, it is true, and I talk about this in the book, that there was um, a kind of paralysis in the Tree of Life synagogue community on their board of directors about what to do with the building. Part of the reason is because um, it did need a substantial renovation because of all the damage inflicted on the building. And if you were going to renovate it, you had to bring it up to code because it was an old building. So you're really looking at a multi-million dollar project for this very large, very old building. And if they were going to raise that kind of money, they were also going to bring in an architect to figure out how to reconceptualize the building. There was also the debate between people who felt, as I gather, you know, you might feel, or maybe some people you're describing feel, that you want to, the way to fight terrorism is you go back in and you say, we're not going to let you keep us down. We're going to be back right away. We're going to keep worshiping, using the building, you know, not going to let the terrorists win. There are people who felt that. And then there were also people in the community, including some people who'd been inside the building at, when the shooting happened, who said, I could never go back into that space. So if we're going to use the building, we have to reconfigure it. We have to gut the building, renovate it, do something different. So there was a kind of paralysis and they ended up doing a lot of listening sessions, a lot of town hall meetings, a lot of kind of thinking, probably more than some people would have liked. And now they have finally hired uh, some architects to plan something and they, they plan to kind of go ahead with a big renovation. But you are correct that many people would have hoped that they would kind of reclaim the building right away. And, um, and they didn't. And that is one of the um, chapters in my book where I think there's kind of more tension and anger than most of the other chapters. So it's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, John, do you want to call yeah. on whoever's next or pose something from the chat? If you have any questions, just to everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. That would be the best way to go. Um, there was one question there, uh, one question here. Um, someone wants to know how you spell the Iranian man's name. Now I could do you a favor and tell, tell the lady to buy the book. Because yeah, but I'll, but go, I'll for it. go for She's it. Gonna, the okay. lady's going to buy the book anyway. I trust you're all going to buy the book, but um, here we go. Uh, Shai Kateri. Yeah, Shai and he's a lovely fellow. Also, if you go to the podcast, if you go to um, on iTunes and listen to Unorthodox, we have an interview with him from back around that time in, in late 2018, uh, which is actually during Hanukkah 2018. And he's a, he's a hoot. He's a funny guy. He's a lovely guy, a generous soul. I still hear from him all the time. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, he's a special person. Um, real, a real humanist. What else can I tell you? Happy I've to talk been, about any aspect of this. I know, I've been asked to call on Elise. Elise, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, yes. So there's a very popular show now from far away on Broadway, and it's actually gone global. And it seems like this story lends itself to that type of production. And I think it's a story that should not go away, the story of Squirrel Hill, and needs to be kept alive. And uh, I've been, I don't want to take too much time. So have you done anything or any has any efforts been made or have you been approached for some sort of a play or theatrical? So there's, yeah. a, there's a Broadway show about, about this? Oh, there is. I didn't know that. No, you, I thought you were saying that there was. I thought no, you were I was there asking was. you if you've been approached. Oh, like, no, no, no. Uh, there, there, I'm working with a documentary film crew as a consultant that uh, may make a documentary about it. Um, and we're actually, we're working on that right now. I don't know if it'll come to fruition. You never know if it, the, these things will, because to make a documentary, you need a lot more buy-in and you need more money. Um, to write a book, you need one person who's willing to, uh, you know, 
to uh, to starve and and fly to Pittsburgh a lot. So it's a different process. But I, I would like for there to be a documentary. There's actually a young woman who grew up in the Squirrelville Jewish community in Carrie Menino, who as her senior thesis at Yale did um, did a play and about what happened. Um, and it got a performance at Yale and it's it's wonderful. And her name is Carrie Menino. And um, I don't know if, if she's going to be able to get further productions of it done, but she's a she's a real talent as a playwright, and she's from the community. So hopefully there will be more done there as well. So yeah, I mean we really you know to keep stories alive is a very important thing, and and certainly most people have forgotten because there are so many mass killings. I have discovered that most people forget any specific one of them. Right. Um, pardon me for beating a dead horse, but with all the anti-Semitism that's going on, I'm a big believer that the arts. Are an important factor. And um, I'm hoping that maybe you'll figure out a way or there's ways to connect you to really fabulous Jewish playwrights like Itamar Moses, who could take this and really make something special. Itamar would be, would love to have Itamar working on it. Um, but no, I mean, I, definitely once a book is out there, certainly playwrights, I think, often take a look at it, often want to option the intellectual property. So it's something we're working on, but I appreciate right. that. Yeah. Good to hear. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, idea. You're welcome. Mary, as I was listening to your talk, uh, it just uh, it seemed to me that the um, uh, not in the shooting and not in the ideology that uh, in, you know that um, propelled the shooting, uh, but in the aftermath, we actually see the American Jewish exceptionalism. And so I want you to put on your sort yeah. of your, your religious. Let me talk a bit about exceptionalism, both in how you brought it up at the beginning in your yeah. preamble, which I thought was very moving, and also now. And I also want to say, by the way, there's such a, a wonderful turnout and so many thoughtful questions already, and I'm really just grateful to have everyone here. So thank you. Um, you know, the, what we mean by American except, Jewish exceptionalism is not that the Jews are exceptional, but that America has been exceptional for the Jews. And I do think that if you look historically at the level of welcome that Jews have received, um, our comfort and ease in society, uh, our ability to do what we want to do, to thrive, you know, our ability to access human flourishing, yep. which is what we want for all human beings. It's what I want for my children. It's what I want for my students. It's what I want for all of you is to be able to flourish by your own lights as best you can and, and, and lead the life that you feel called to lead. The United States the, has had few rivals in creating, fostering that kind of environment. Uh, Canada and Australia would be the two, as Israel obviously is a special case and is a different kind and obviously um, is extraordinary, an extraordinary place for Jewish flourishing. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a different case. If we're talking outside of, outside of Israel, if we're talking the diaspora that began some 2000 years ago, um, Canada, Australia, and the United States have been, I think, the three great examples of that. I will get emails from, from French Jews quarreling with me and South American Jews, but I, I will stick by that. Um, and, you know, there is a way in which anti-Semitism, a form of anti-Semitism is largely dead, which is to say it is very hard to find a country club. When people talked about anti-Semitism 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, what they were likely talking about was the law firm that wouldn't promote you to partner if you were Jewish, the country club that wouldn't admit you, the neighborhood association that wouldn't admit you, the university that wouldn't admit you. My father got into Yale in 1963 at a time when every Yale college class was still 10% Jewish, no more, no less, right? Under the quotas. They, the quotas were ended while he was at Yale College, but he was a, he was a quota baby. Um, that kind of anti-Semitism is largely gone. I don't know, do not think there are many law firms or medical practices or country clubs that have any meaningful bar against Jewish membership. I'm sure there's something somewhere in America, but it is vanishingly small compared to what it once was. On the other hand, you are correct that the majority of anti-religious hate crimes as the FBI and the Anti-Defamation League track them are committed against Jews. And the religious group that is most likely percentage-wise to be targeted with hate crimes is not Muslims, is not Mormons, is not... Um, is not Hindus, it is Jews. If you are a Jew, and, and those crimes are almost certain to be perpetrated against people who, who perform the brave act of looking publicly Jewish. That is to say, they wear a yarmulke or they, wear, or they are women in Orthodox garb. They somehow wear Jewish garb, or they wear side locks, their hair, a woman in a wig, et cetera. So the people on the front lines of the re receiving the brutality of anti-Semitism are Jews who go out of the house publicly looking Jewish. It's not people like me who, who can pass. Right. And for those Jews, it is very real. And when I've been with Jews who look publicly Jewish, 
even the benign stuff, the person who walks by, the alcoholic who walks by and says like, hey, mazel tov. I mean, just, just says something Jewish to them as if to say, I see you, you big Jew, right? This is very real and it's, it's persistent for a lot of them. So, um, you know, America is both a promised land for Jews, but also a place where there is meaningful anti-Semitism. I always make the point that we've never had a national religious figure, uh, excuse me, a national political figure who looks publicly Jewish. So Joe Lieberman got very far, but he got very far as somebody who never publicly wears a yarmulke. We have never had a yarmulke wearing man come anywhere near the presidency in this country. And I don't think we're about to anytime soon. Contrast that with, with Christian symbolism. You know, wearing a cross will, will win you votes in America. Okay. And wearing a yarmulke will probably end your career in most places. So it's a very complicated thing. Um, but to your point, you know, um, one way in which we have been exceptional is in making tight knit ethnic neighborhoods. Most of them have largely gone by the wayside as um, Jews have dispersed to the suburbs in search of three car garages and swimming pools. And, you know, they don't really care about being in neighborhood with other Jews anymore. Um, but in Squirrel Hill, they still do. And there are historical reasons for that. Jews, the Squirrel Hill has made concerted efforts to keep its Jewish core and to keep Jewish institutions like Jewish Social Work Agency, Jewish Home for the Aged, um, Jewish Day Schools for Children. They've worked very hard to keep them in a geographically concentrated area, and they've succeeded. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me just um, return to... Um... Uh, from Jacqueline Adams, thank you for your lively and very well illustrated talk. Your talk makes me think that perhaps resilience and recovery might be easier when there is an outpouring of support from the non-Jewish community. What, what do you think? I, I mean, unquestionably, right, that Gentile allies were a huge part of this. You know, Jews are a minority people. We're a minority people in this country. Arguably, we're 2% of the country at most, and that's, I think that's a stretch. And in most parts of the country where Jews live, they're a tiny, tiny minority. I mean, they're a minority almost everywhere, even in supposedly Jewish communities, right? Even people think, oh, Newton, Massachusetts, Brookline, Massachusetts, the Upper West Side, um, you know, these are Jewish neighborhoods. They're not majority Jewish, you know, the way that there are neighborhoods that are majority Christian or majority black or even majority Muslim or, you know, there are no Jew, there are almost no Jewish neighborhoods that are majority Jewish. Jews are a minority in America and in American communities. And when there is support from Gentile allies, it means the world. And it has to be a reminder to Jews, and I think it has been in Squirrel Hill, that when other people suffer, when there's anti-Muslim bias or anti-queer bias or you know, acts of violence toward women, that you know, we should be on the front lines as well because it's a pluralist country and it works insofar as we feel that we are part of a common project. And I think that America is a great land, and, but part of what keeps it great is the sort of endlessly renewed energy of support in you know, person to person, it's not because of our politicians, it's not because of our leaders, it's not even because of our entertainment industry, as important as that all is, um, it's, it's because of the sort of a fundamental civic decency and how we treat each other. And I think Squirrel Hill had a lot of examples of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, how, what's, the, what's the mood like today there? You know, someone asked me that last night and I said, I haven't been since COVID started. <laughs> I'm going later this month. I'll be there on the, the eve of the anniversary. I'll be there October 26th. Um, you know, my, I think that COVID was, um, look, one of the arguments of my book is that, that people thrive when they see each other and when they can hug each other and when they bump into each other on street corners, that it's these serendipitous accidental meetings that, that really build resilience. I don't think the internet does that. Um, I love being with all of you on Zoom and it's it's an improvement over not being with you, but it's not as good as being with you in person. And I think that um, this is a twisted thing to say, but I can only say that I'm immensely grateful as I imagine the people in Squirrel Hill are, that they were not also facing COVID lockdowns when this happened, because I think the person to person contact, you know, the idea of a Shiva call, when you go to someone's house in the seven days after someone has died, you go to the survivor's house and you sit with them and you don't even necessarily say anything. In fact, the tradition is you don't approach them and say anything. You sit and just be and just sort of have have a put your body near their body in solidarity. So important. So I think that um, you know, I think obviously there's been a pause to a lot of that in Squirrel Hill. And I I um but I think that you know they had a good year and a half of being with each other in person before that happened. Okay. Um Edie Reba Murphy writes, um, thank you for writing this book and thank you for making the audio book. 
which I've been listening to for a couple of days. I grew up at the Tree of Life Synagogue and uh, could see myself at every single place you described in the book. I didn't know much about the history of Squirrel Hill and I appreciate all the background of my old home neighborhood. Thank you. It was very moving for you to say that. Recording the audiobook was a new experience for me. I wanted to do it myself. I was given the option by my publisher. I could either do it myself or they would hire someone, an actor to do it for me. And I said, I think I should do it myself, not only because I would get the names right, but also it, it just felt right to me to do it. Um, so it's it's arduous hearing yourself talk for three days in a studio, uh, but, um, but I'm glad I did it and I'm glad that you responded to it. Uh, Joshua Steinfeld asks, did you talk with the students of your daughter's age at the time who lived and went to school in Squirrel Hill? Not my daughter's age, because she was a junior high student at the time, but I, I talked and, and quote from a number of students at Alderdice High School, the public high school in Squirrel Hill, which is a very famous, um, historically, you know, not majority Jewish anymore, but, you know, a famous iconic high school in the history of American Jewry. A lot of people, it's a big public high school in the 50s at the height of the baby boom. They operated on a three shifts a day um, mm. because it was, there were so many children, so many kids in Squirrel Hill. It was that thriving a neighborhood. And, um, all, you know, Taylor Alderdice is, kind of has a place in American Jewish history. Um, and I, I sat with a bunch of Alderdice students and talked with them about it, and, and especially the ones who helped organize some of the, the memorial and solidarity activities, but also the ones who worked on the school newspaper. And I talked to the principal of the high school. I talked to some of their teachers. I also talked to African-American students there, some of whom felt um, concern and bewilderment that, that the Jewish deaths had gotten so much attention when they felt that deaths in their own community had not gotten as much attention. And I, I gave voice to that in the book as well. Um, Dan Granoff writes, uh, I understand the Tree of Life renovation will be more than as a synagogue and that the architect who worked on the Twin Towers Memorial is the main architect. Do you know the plans for this? So this is really interesting. I have followed this a bit. I don't have any special knowledge. Everything I know you can find in articles in the New York Times or the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I, I don't have any inside sources on this. But uh, they did, they appointed Daniel Liebeskind, who's a fairly famous uh, Jewish architect, um, who's worked on several Holocaust museums and was the, he was the master planner for the Ground Zero renovation. I don't know if he did the, the tower that rose up on that site. And he's working with a local architect named Dan Rothschild, who has done a lot of Jewish community projects in Pittsburgh. I think the plan is for it to be a multi-purpose space that will be part synagogue and worship space, part education center, um, part museum or memorial to the to the victims. It'll be very expensive. They haven't raised all the money yet. Um, there are definitely some skeptics who wonder how much use this building will get. Tree of Life had lost most of its membership in the past 20 years. At its peak, it was 900 or 1,000 families. It's now down to probably under 250, and this was true before the before seven of the regulars were murdered. Um, mm -hmm. So the question of how much sense it makes to bring it, to keep it, to, to spend a lot of money on a new synagogue space for a congregation that already had too much space, which is why they were renting parts of it to two other synagogues, is, a, is an open question. But um, I don't expect we'll see any anything shovel ready for at least several more years. Okay. Um. <clears throat> There don't seem to be any, there are some comments, but uh, does anyone have any specific questions for Mark? We have an Alderdice alum here, class of 66. So he might've known my dad, Tim Oppenheimer, who was Shadyside Academy 63. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I always, I love getting into the Pittsburgh geography, uh, which is really, really interesting. Um, and I also love the people who, uh, who, you know, who sort of, point me to other neighborhoods that have important parts of Jewish history. I should say that I am fairly a neighborhood obsessive. Um, I think the neighborhood is like the great missing piece of a lot of questions. I just read a fabulous book that I would recommend to all of you um, that uh, called uh, Dreamland. It was by Sam, I wanna say Quinones, but it might be another Latina last name. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, who's a journalist for the Los Angeles Times. And, um, is about the opioid epidemic. And he, he writes 350 brilliant pages about OxyContin and Purdue Pharma and heroin and how it all kind of flowed together. And when he gets to the very end in the afterward, he sort of pivots and says, keep in mind the children who were getting addicted to these things were also children who grew up in, 
in a country that no longer let them play outside, that no longer was investing in public swimming pools, that that expected children to stay inside and supervised and, um, you know, uh, watch TV and play video games. And that, you know, um, when we do that, when we basically destroy um, neighborhood, when we take that out of, yeah, Sam Quinones is right. When we take the neighborhood out of our children's lives and, um, and just devote ourselves to screens, we shouldn't be surprised when more of them end up as addicts. And I, you know, he makes the case a little more in a more sophisticated way than I'm making it here. But, um, but I do think that, you know, thriving neighborhood where people see each other a lot, human contact is so important. And, you know, proximity to each other, living close to each other is just gives us more human contact. And that really is what I wanted to write a book about. And I think that people who grew up in other tight-knit neighborhoods, whether Jewish or, or Black or ethnic Catholic or Muslim, like, they will know what I am talking about. I happen to live in such a neighborhood in Westville, in New Haven, Connecticut. I grew up in one in Springfield, Massachusetts called Forest Park. So this is very deep in my bones. And I think this is a book about Judaism. It's a book about mass killing. But more than anything, it really is about, as the, as the mm -hmm. subtitle says, about the soul of a neighborhood. And I, I, I commend it to you as that, for that subject matter. Um, there are a whole lot of uh, mentions here of um, Allardyce, which I'm not sure. I don't, Alderdice. I don't, Taylor Alderdice High School. I no, I have no idea. I have no idea. And I'm sure there are a few others who are not in the know either. So maybe you can. Um, well, that's the high school that okay. the kids I interviewed okay. were from, was Taylor Alderdice High School. Uh, I also want to say to Keith Mostov that my dad also went to Whiteman Elementary School and a few years ago organized a 50th reunion of his eighth grade class. You can find out if you go to the Post-Gazette website about that. But I mean, these these neighborhood institutions, it, they're so deep in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh also, let, let me conclude, I'll let you conclude, John, when, whenever you want. But, you know, if I went out saying this, it would be fine, which is that... Um, Pittsburgh is a very stable place. It, it lost about half its population in the 80s when the steel mills closed. So there's a sense in which it's very unstable. And yet, I met so many multi-generational families in Squirrel Hill, so many people who had grown up in Squirrel Hill, they moved away, they did the New York thing or the Chicago thing or the LA thing. And then when they were having children of their own or when they got married or found a partner, they said, you know, I really want to move back to Squirrel Hill. And they did. And so many people were living in their childhood houses. So many people, I met one family where the parents had moved to the in-law house, the apartment over the garage and the, the second generation and the grandchildren, the third generation had taken over the big house. And it is the kind of place that just has that sort of continuity, those kind of neighborhood institutions. It's a battle, you know, a lot of people are moving to the suburbs. Um, and, uh, you know, there are people fighting to keep the soul of Squirrel Hill alive. But I think that spending time with them was was very special for me and seeing how much those things matter and just how how rich their lives are with that kind of transgenerational, intergenerational continuity um, is pretty unforgettable. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so. Um, let me just see here. Uh, Keith Mostoff, I was bar mitzvah at Dor Hadash in 1969. I was one of the congregations that was attacked, that lost a right. member. Uh, Mark member. Dinkin, I worked at Dor Hadash, 1964 to 66. Um, Susan Chupak, I was a bat mitzvah at Dor Hadash. Um, so it's quite, quite remarkable, actually, that there's such a, a diaspora of, uh, of people who were, had, would be, had been there. Well, and, and you know, part of that is because... Not necessarily for these people, but in general, part of the reason that there are Pittsburghers everywhere is because there literally are Pittsburghers everywhere, because so many people did leave in the 80s. So many people or or, or post-college people didn't come back for about 20 or 30 years. There were because the city was shrinking, because the steel industry was having such tough times and the city was in a recession. People didn't move back. So they moved to other places. So meeting people who grew up in Pittsburgh when you're in San Diego or Chicago or Portland, Oregon or Augusta, Maine or whatever, meeting Pittsburghers is actually a very common experience because it really is a very, very big diaspora. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's been so neat about the book is I know that wherever I go, I will meet a Pittsburgher. <laughs> and, and I do. Yeah. I, uh, I, just so. the, I just noticed at the time in the wake of the, in, in the, wake of the shooting, uh, there, were, there were quite a few people who were on TV in, in journalism, in the news. Uh, who said that they had been at, 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 in that community as well uh, and had been at that synagogue, um, which was, yeah. also, was also a surprise, you know? No, it's, 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 it, there are Pittsburghers everywhere. Yeah. There really are. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
any any final questions for Mark? I don't hear anything. It's a little difficult on Zoom. Well, it's been a real treat. Thank you. Anyway, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, so thank you Berkeley. It's been it's been, uh, it's it's been a treat for us. It, as I said at the beginning, because I've read it, it's an incredibly important book. I would urge you all all to buy it because there's so much more in it than Mark was able to to tell us about here. Um, but it is uh, it is um, you know it, it, it's it's a terrible tale, and and Mark does tell that tale but doesn't spend uh, all of his time on that. But then there's another story, an aftermath, and that's the kind of story that. Uh, this was so widely covered in the news, but the aftermath is not. Once it's over, you know, the news leaves, mm -hmm. right? journalism leaves, and there's a yet another story to tell. And that's the story that you've told here about a Jewish community left reeling, um, left uh, devastated, um, and how they, uh, you know, how they get back up on their feet again. Um, and for some, they don't. It's not all a fairy tale. I'm quite sure there are people who are not like the 91 year old man. Um, Absolutely, there's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of trauma, and I touch on that as well. But it's uh, but there's also a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It's the full panoply of uh, of emotions. So we want to thank you, and it was a pleasure having you at Berkeley. <laughs> and I look forward to the next time when we can really do it. And I want to thank everyone else, every one of you for coming and. Um, uh, it's you who make possible our talks. And we have another one tomorrow, by the way, uh, also on an aspect of Judaism. Uh, Menachem Karen Krantz is an Israeli scholar and uh, one of the world's great authorities on uh, ultra-Orthodox Hungarian Judaism, Satma Judaism, which was very important in Europe, but also perhaps even more important in the United States today. Um, and so uh, it's at five o'clock tomorrow. Um, and this, you, you register for it as well uh, as you did for this talk. And uh, I hope that, to see you there again tomorrow. Okay, with that, thanks, Mark. Safe travels wherever you are next. Okay. Thank all of you as well. Bye-bye. Oh,